Welcome, everyone. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. My name is Jeff Kripal. I am the Associate Dean of the School of Humanities at Rice University and the J. Newton Razor Professor of Religion. It is my pleasure to represent the School of Humanities for this second installment in the Kazumi Lectures on Shi'i Studies, which is being co-organized by, by our own Department of Transnational Asian Studies. The inaugural lecture was held at the MFAH last December with Francesca Leone, the assistant keeper and curator of Islamic art at the Ashmolean Museum of Art and Archaeology at the University of Oxford. This wonderful lecture series is made possible through a generous gift from the children of Syed Safdar and Samini Kazimi. This new endowment allows Rice to bring world-class scholars across the spectrum of Shi'i studies who will share their research with the Rice community, the broader Houston public, and with this present webinar format with the world. The location of the endowment in the School of Humanities will allow us to feature speakers from different disciplines who will explore Shi'i religious thought, art, culture, and history that remain relatively under-recognized despite their significance historically and in the modern world. We are extremely pleased that the Kazumi family could join us today. It is my great honor to introduce to you today, Dr. Syed Hussein Nasser. Dr. Nasser is University Professor of Islamic Studies, George Washington University. After graduating from MIT with a bachelor in physics, he received a master's in geophysics and a PhD in the history of science from Harvard University. In 1958, Dr. Nasser returned to Iran to teach Islamic philosophy at Tehran University, where he later served as vice chancellor and dean of the Faculty of Letters. Dr. Nasser was the first Muslim to deliver the prestigious Gifford and Cadbury lectures and was inducted to the Library of Living Philosophers in 2000. He has published over 50 books and 650 articles on Islamic science, philosophy, comparative religion, Islamic ecology and environmentalism, art, and Sufism. As the above makes clear, Dr. Nasser, Nasser is a towering figure in the field of Islamic studies and religious studies more broadly. Well known for bringing much needed attention and appreciation to the profound philosophical and esoteric dimensions of Shi'i Islam. His lecture today is entitled Shi'ism and Sufism, a morphological and historical survey in it, Dr. Nasser will address how Shiism and Sufism became or become distinct schools after the Islamic revelation, what their specific shapes or features are, and how the two key themes of sanctity and esotericism in these two schools of thought have interacted and have been interpreted in different ways at different times. Please join me in welcoming to Rice University, Dr. Sayed Hussein Nasser. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I always begin with the name of God, which is traditionally what we do in the Islamic world. Thank you very much for your introduction. And I'm very happy to be able to spend a few minutes, although from far away, with uh, members of the university at Rice. I've visited Rice University before many times in the old days, and it's called the Harvard of the South and come from Harvard of the North, so we have something in common as far as the intellectual and academic background is concerned, perhaps. Uh, I've been asked to give a lecture on a very complicated, but also very similar and important subject, and that is the relationship between Shiism and Sufism. Uh, let me begin by, first of all, uh, clarifying terms. Uh, the word Shiism, I begin with the beginning, uh, from the beginning, because some people will not be aware of it, is a reference to a branch of Islam, uh, which constitutes about 13% of the Muslims of the world today. So numerically, is much uh, smaller than the majority branch called Sunnism. But the Shahs are concentrated in an area primarily between Iraq and Pakistan. And in that area, they have a very large concentration. And there are several countries which are Shiite majority, of course, most important being Iran in number and also size, but also Iraq and the Republic of Azerbaijan uh, with major minorities in the Persian Gulf region and also in Pakistan and India. 
uh, Sunnism constitutes the rest of the Islamic world. Uh, uh, theologically and legally speaking, the word Shiite itself is very important to understand because it gives you a key to the nature of uh, this particular int interpretation of Islam. It's is actually the abbreviation of Shia Ali. That Shia means the parties of or the partisans of Ali Ali ibn Abi Talib, the first cousin and son in law of the Prophet of Islam, A L I, you know, it's a common word in English, Ali, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and it's a Shiite uh, branch of Islam that identified actually with his name, with those people who, after the death of the Prophet, did not accept that Abu Bakr become the first caliph, who became the first Sunni caliph, and uh, they became the partisan of Ali. And so the name Shizan comes from that. The word Sunnism comes from the word Sunnah, which is a wide range of meanings in the Quran. Sunnatullah uh, means actually the ways of God, the, the uh, traditions of God, how God creates the world and sustains it and so forth. Uh, but it also means the son of the prophet, that is the doings and sayings and action of the prophet, which are the second most important uh, source for Islamic law and practices and morality and many other aspects of Islam. And the word Sunnism uh, was an abbreviation in English of Ahlat Sunnah wa Jama'ah. That is people who follow the son of the prophet and the majority the Qaeda majority. So Shiism is a minority religion, but its impact uh, upon Islamic history, all the way from art to philosophy, is immense. And if you have said, consider the central lands of Islam from Egypt to Pakistan today, there the, it's not a question of only 13% to 87% 80, or so, something like that, but to the 1% of the Khawarij. Uh, but uh, it means a uh, kind of uh, balance existence, uh, even numerically, in many countries. I have no time here to go over uh, where the Shiites are, where the population is. Uh, that's not for this, for this course, for this talk. What I'm going to try to explain is the relation between not Shiism and Sunnism, but Shiism and Sufism, uh, which uh, exists within Sunni Islam and also exists within uh, shared Islam, and in a very complicated manner. To understand that, uh, I have to go back to the foundations of the Islamic revelation. Uh, the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi, I would say, uh, was at once a prophet, a nabi, of course, known as the prophet, one said the prophet, the capital piece is in reference to him, the prophet like Moses, and from our point of view of Christ, whom considered to be a great prophet before the prophet of Islam, or Abraham and Noah and so forth, and the line of great prophets that goes back to the origin of humanity in the Jewish Christian Islamic traditions. Uh, but he was, also, he was also a wali. And uh, the word wali, W-A-L-I, has many, many meanings in Arabic. It can be saint, it can be person possessing initiation. It also means domination, rule, is in one of the names of God, God is Wali, but also means a saint who's close to God, Wali, friend. Waliullah in Arabic, the word for saint is Waliullah, the friend of God. So the power that the prophet inherited or received from God parallel with the power of Novova or prophecy, uh, which uh, in contrast to prophecy, did not die out with him. When the prophet died, uh, the power of Novova and the function of Novova came to an end. It's called in the Quran, Khatim al Nabiyin or Khatim al Anbiya. That means the seal or the end of the prophetic uh, chain, prophetic cycle. But uh, the power of Walaya continued after him and has existed throughout the Islamic world for the last 14 centuries, manifesting itself in many different ways, sometimes even political. As when Ayatollah Khomeini came to Iran and created the idea of the before the few years before that was an exile in Iraq, 
of Walaata Faqih. Here the world, uh, Walaya means rule, actually, of the jurisprudence, which is a foundation of the present structure of Iran today, but it has been for the last 40 years. So, Walaya, I'm going to use the Arabic term from now on. You have both Walaya and Walaya, the meanings are related, but they're not identical. It's a very complicated matter I will not go into. But just remember that the Prophet received not only the legislating power, which enabled him to bring a new Sharia, a new divine law, regulation of society and so forth, but also this initiatic power, which is a foundation of the spiritual path, uh, traveling towards God, of sanctity, of the inner life in Islam, and has many, many different applications, ramifications. One could write books and books just on the term walaya walaya. Uh, during the time of the Prophet, already all the realities that were to manifest themselves later on in Islam in a sense present. Like Christianity, like any other religion, the seed is always there. A big tree comes out later, but all the elements of that tree are already in that seed. The seed of an apple tree will give you apples and not pears. It's already in that little seed, but it's going to develop later on. The religion is to a large extent like that. Uh, at the beginning, at the time of the Prophet, you might say there were already these two dimensions, the soul of the Prophet, one of which corresponded to uh, his proximity to companions, uh, em very eminent companions like Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman, who became the first three caliphs of Sunni Islam, and one which corresponded to Ali, the daughter of the Prophet Fatima, who is the most sanctified woman in, in Islam, represents a feminine spiritual religious element, not only for Shia Islam, but also in Sunni Islam. She's a very important figure, and everybody thinks Islam is only patriarchal. No, it's a very important uh, feminine element in it, spiritually also, historically, and also his two grandchildren, Hassan and Hussein. And what became crystallized as Shiism is to be found already, in a sense, in the being of the Prophet, in the deeper sense. After his death, these two elements began to separate. First, as you said, the Shiites are those who did not accept the uh, Sunni Caliph Abu Bakr. It was not a question of identity of person. The question of what would be the function of the person who would succeed the Prophet and there's the question where the question of Walaya comes in on a very complicated issue. If I were talking about here about the political succession of the Prophet, I will get into that, but I will not. But you must remember that. It was that, that, that the separation of the partisan of Ali, who became known as Shiite, is not only the question of who should be caliph, but what his function should be. What his function should be. And the Shiites consider Ali to have been designated by the Prophet to be the main heir to his spiritual heritage. And that the, the famous saying of the Prophet that, that they chose Ali as a wasi, as a person who inherits from him, and the Shiites interpret this as inheriting it also as a spiritual message, not only a ruling over the Islamic community. Now, <clears throat> from that, uh, uh, you might say, spiritual energy that was created by the Islamic revelation and continued down the centuries, according to the Sufis by the will of God and according to the charge by the will of God, the Walaya continued. Nabobwa came to an end with the prophet, Walaya continued. And the question of seal of Walaya is a very complicated issue about which Ibn Arabi, others wrote many books into which I will not go in an elementary lecture like this. Anyway, during the next two or three centuries, I want to first give you a morphological understanding before I get to the uh, details of history. Uh, the living Imams were around. That is, the, I'm talking essentially about 12 Imam Shiism, not about Ismailism, uh, which is a mainstream Shiism. It has 12 Imams, that's what we call Ethna Ashari, 12 Imam Shiism. They were alive. They were alive. 
until the second Islamic century and through the second Islamic century. And the first eight of them were all very significant as poles, as a spiritual poles, of what came to be known as Sufism, especially Ali himself. In Sufism, we have a chain. We have a chain of transmission. Like you have in Catholicism, the apostolic succession. If Peter uh, had not received that authority from Christ, he would not have become the founder of, the, of Western Christianity and the first uh, uh, apostle. And then you have others. And in the Catholic Church, you have something uh, called apostolic succession, which if I give the Pope the power that he has, and because of that is a Pope, something similar to that, not identical, because the Catholic element also includes many social, political uh, elements in the Middle Ages, Avignon, uh, Rome, all of those things. I don't mean in that sense, but in the sense of a power that was transmitted uh, after the prophet, spiritually this is identified uh, with Ali and the later imams, up to the eighth imam, Imam Ali al rada who is buried in Mashhad, a city in Khorasan, in present-day Iran, in northeastern Iran, near the Turkmen border, a very big city of several million people, at the heart of which is a great mausoleum of uh, Imam Raza. The, the Shias call them Imams, with a cap, we write it with a capital I because you can be the Imam leading the prayers, you can be the Imam of a mosque, Imam has many, many meanings, you can be a religious leader, but this is a very technical meaning uh, of Imam. The first eight were identified by Shiites as their Imams, that is Ali, Hassan, Hussein, Zanun al-Badin, and so forth and so on. I will not name them all. They're all poles of the Sufi orders. They're extremely important in Sunni Sufism, in, in Sufism, wherever it is outside of a Shiite world. Uh, there's a very, very complicated matter. For example, the third Shiite Imam, Hussein ibn Ali, after whom I'm named, Hussein. Now it's become a common word after Obama became president of the United States. You all have heard the name Hussein, or Saddam Hussein, who was killed in Iraq by the American invasion of Iraq. Uh, uh, Hussein uh, was the grandson of the Prophet. But at the same time, he's very, very important in uh, Sunni. Sufism. Imam Hassan, his older brother, who's the second Imam, most of the great Sufi orders in North Africa. And in fact, all the Shorafa, the people who are descendants of the Prophet, most of them are descendants of Hassan. And the founders of Islam in North Africa were also the founders of Sufism in North Africa, uh, in uh, Morocco. Uh, but descendants of Imam Hassan. So these first eight, each of them is very, very important, a pole that is a central figure of Sufism in Sunni Sufism, especially the sixth Imam, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, who is both the founder of Shiite law, but also the main figure of many Sufi orders. Of all the different Sufi orders in the world, of all the different Sufi orders in the world, everyone comes back to Ali in his chain. It's a chain like the apostolic succession that I mentioned for you. We have been sort of that is a master initiates the disciple, becomes a master who initiates the disciple over the centuries. And from the 12th century onward, this became more organized in the name of Sufi orders. Uh, of uh, all, all the members of that chain received uh, the barakah uh, of the first Shiite Imams, except one. The only Sufi order which does not go back to Ali is the Naqshbandi order. Paradoxically, a Persian Sufi order, not an Arabic one, founded by Sheikh Bahauddin Naqshband, 
in what is today Central Asia and Uzbekistan, which was in the central part of Persia, of Khorasan, and the orders completely Persian, the texts are in Persian, uh, the teachings, of course, the prayers and so forth are in Arabic, but uh, the intellectual part of it and the literary part of the Naqshbandi order is most in the Persian language and which spread very, very widely throughout India and the Ottoman Empire and today is one of the most popular Sufi orders in the Islamic world. That does not go back to Ali, it goes back to Mount Jafar as sadiq But the present sheikhs of the, of the Naqshbandi order, we talk to them, they said in a sense we go back to Ali because we go back to Mount Jafar as sadiq all the other Sufi orders, completely Sunni Sufi order like the Rafa'iya, Qadriya, uh, Khalwatiya, and so forth, the son of to burn of Nashadliya, they all go back to Sayyidina Ali and Tazrat Ali. Uh, so it's both the first Imam of Shiism and the pole and origin of Sufism in the Sunni world. This is the most important fact to remember. From this uh, treasury, as so as the French say, this treasury of uh, initiatic knowledge and power and the possibility of traveling upon the spiritual path made possible by what but bequeathed by the Prophet upon primarily Ali, but also upon a small number of other disciples around him, uh, they uh, gradually developed uh, Sufism. Now, the word Sufism was not used until the second Islamic century. It was used for the first time in southern Iraq and gradually became very popular. I will not go into its derivation, why? Because the word Suf has, can have many different meanings. Anyway, but I won't get, get, get into that, I don't have time. But anyway, the word became common gradually from Mesopotamia and spread elsewhere into Syria, into Persia, into Egypt, and so forth. And by the third Islamic century, you had uh, many, many Sufis with the center in Baghdad, the school of Baghdad was established, and they were Sunnis. These early Sufis were Sunnis. Were there any early Shiite uh, Sufis? Not by that name, but they were. They were, they were without doubt, people who followed the inner teachings of uh, Ali. Now, we have here a very complicated paradox that I really cannot get into deeply, but I feel it's my duty to at least mention it. In Sunni Islam, the exoteric and the esoteric, the law and the way or the spiritual path of Sufism are distinct from each other. There are people who are masters of both, who are authorities in both. Yes, many, many of them. But they're distinct from each other. In Shia Islam, you have, they're sort of combined in a way. You do have Shiites who are against Sufism. No, no doubt about that. Some of the ulama even today in Iran, I'll, I'll look to them in my talk. But uh, they were combined with each other. The saints of the Shiite Imams, for example, have remarkable Sufi metaphysical agnostic elements in them. Not only of Imam Jafar al Sadr, the hadith of many other Imams. Uh, and uh, to this day, uh, let's say in my own country, Iran, uh, at least before I became an, went into exile, uh, when people wanted to receive initiation, finding a spiritual master, they would go to Mashhad and pray that Imam Rada would help them find the spiritual master. The two were intertwined. So, but at the same time, Shiism was not Sufism. It had its law, its theology, its usul al fiqh, usul, uh, and all, all different kinds of religious sciences, Quran and commentary. So uh, you have this different situation that you must understand between Sunnism and Shiism. Now, as it developed later on, you might say that you have Sufism in Sunni Islam. And you have Sufism in Shia Islam. But you also have a Sufi element, esoteric element, in the structure of Shiism itself, which paradoxically led 
Shizam at a certain the ulama have a more difficulty with the Sufi orders than the Sunnis did, which is a very uh, paradoxical matter, but it can be understood. Anyway, you had a uh, crisscrossing of influences, therefore, between uh, Shiite Gnosis, what's called Erfana Shi'i in Persian, and which is very prevalent in Iran even now, and Sufism. So let me repeat, you had in the Sunni world, you had Sufism, Sufi orders, and then you had the Sharia and the Ulama. In the Shiite world, you also had the Sufi orders, but you also had a kind of presence of Sufism within the general body of Shiism and Shia piety and practice. Even some of the prayers, for example, a famous prayer is shared between Imam Hussein and Abu Hassan al-Shadali, the great uh, originally Moroccan, but died in Egypt, founder of the Shadali order. Uh, so there was a crisscrossing that went on all the time. And I do not want us to think that the two are completely separate, they don't talk to each other, not at all, not at all. Uh, later on when Persia became Shiite, Sunni uh, Sufi works were more popular than in Arabia, uh, even before it became Wahhabi. Uh, so it's not, it's not a question of ethnicity whatsoever. It's, it's a much more complicated matter. They're all intertwining. Uh, the greatest expositor of doctrine of, in Sufism in the Sunni world is Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi. A-R-A-B-I. Ibn I-B-N. Ibn Arabi. You shall just know his name. Uh, he was from Murcia in southern Spain and died in Damascus and had tremendous impact upon the last seven centuries of Islamic history. No one has had the intellectual impact that he has had. He was a Su Sunni, of course, never, but not a Shiite at all. He was a belonged to the Zahiri, one of the most, uh, po uh, let me just say, one of the least Shiite-inclined uh, schools in uh, Sunni Islam. But at the same time, he was well acquainted with a lot of Shiite thought. And you see some elements, some elements of that and it's for Tawat al -Makia. So it's a very complicated situation, but give and take. A country like Egypt, it's all Shafi, it's all Sunni, except about 50,000 Ismailis who live in the south, but near Aswan, and a small number of Shiites in Cairo who are mostly descendants of Persian immigrants who, who went to settle in Egypt. But in Egypt, although they're Shafi, they have great love for the family of the Prophet, Ahlul Bayt. Because the center of Shiite piety is the love of the family of the Prophet, Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt means people of the Prophet's household, people of the household. They have great love for him. And sometimes they show, say jokingly, I'll go to, I've been to Israel, God knows how many times, they would say jokingly that you Persians are the Shia of Huz, of uh, sadness. She will cry for Imam Hussein. We are the Shia of joy, of Farah, because we, the head of Imam Hussein is buried in Cairo. The whole city of Cairo is around his head. There would be no Cairo without the head of Imam Hussein. Uh, there was one ep episode that occurred after the Karbala, the death of Hussein, which crystallized early Shiism. Uh, uh, that uh, I didn't get into, but it's a whole story unto itself. So you have a very complicated situation, not to be confused with either the present day Iranian uh, Saudi rivalry in the Middle East uh, or a Shiite Sunni differences in Syria are better by forces from the outside and things like that. These are recent and rather superficial events. When you look at deeper down, the situation is very different, but always a crisscrossing of influences of give and take. And we have some uh, Sunni Sufi orders which are very close to Shias, and I shall mention uh, them in a moment. Anyway, before my uh, time comes to an end, now I have to turn to the second part of my talk, which has to do with the history of the relationship between Shiism and uh, Sunnism, with the different interpretations of Walaya, of initiation, of guidance, of salvation, of deliverance, of divine knowledge. All of these how each uh, group saw it and how they interacted with each other. 
that's a vast, vast subject. Uh, that, uh, a lot of works have to be done, and there are some, a few good works, but there's still a lot to be done on the subject historically. So let's start uh, historically on devout Islamic history. In the early centuries, in the early centuries, let's say up to the fourth Islamic century, 10th to 11th Christian century, uh, what you had, they definitely had both Sunnism and Shias, no doubt. But it was not a clear line of demarcation always. Except, of course, someone was a faqih. Uh, but in, among the general intelligentsia, sometimes it was very difficult to see who was a Sunni or a Shia. I spent half of my life studying Ibn Sina and Abu Rahman al Biruni, two of the greatest uh, scientists and scholars and philosophers of Islamic history. Now, what is Shia or Sunni? How many books have been written in Arabic and Persian trying to show no, they were Shia, no, they were Sunni? We, I've always told the story to my students. Uh, Abu Rahman al Biruni used to wear a ring, perhaps the greatest early scientist of Islam, used to wear a ring which had the four caliphs, the Sunni caliphs, the Rashidun, inscribed on it, but also the name of the 12 Imams on the same ring. And uh, who knows whether it was Sunni or Shia? I certainly don't. Uh, some, uh, maybe some new document will one day come up. Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina's father was Ismaili. Ibn Ismaili is a very important branch of Shiism, especially in the early century of Islam where they captured Egypt and the, the Fatimids ruled and it's they who built Cairo around the head of Sayyidina Hussein, the Zainab, the sister of Hussein, after the head of her brother was severed by Yazid's army in Iraq, was sent to Damascus and from there was exiled into Egypt. Uh, now, uh, in the earlier days, it was very difficult to, to, to say. It was not like, like today. Who was a Sunni and who was a Shiite? Yes, uh, Ibn Sina's father was a Smiley, but there's no reference in Ibn Sina directly to Smiley at all, and to even ethno uh, Shiism. The present day Persians claim that he was a Shiite, but that's a claim. Uh, I have spent a little time on Ibn Sina, I know a little bit about him. If you were to ask me, I could not say with such certainty. It was a period which, in which there was a malleability in the early centuries, a crisscrossing of influences of, uh, for example, uh, the Sunnis have six books of prophetic hadith called in Arabic Sahih, which means the correct book, and the plural Sahah in Arabic. They have the Sahah Sitta, the six correct books very, very famous, a Bukhari, a Muslim, and so forth. They came out, they were written first. At that time, the Shiites had not written their own book of Hadith. It was around. It was after the Sunnis wrote that the Shiites then wrote their four books, Qutb al-Arba, the four books of Shiite Hadith. And there are many interactions back and forth like that over the centuries. And also the question of enmity or friendship and so forth and so on is very complicated. It isn't that the way they make it on the papers so that the Sunnis and Shiites have been fighting each other for 1400 years. Uh, totally absurd. Absolutely absurd. Before the war of 1975 in Lebanon, uh, how many families in Lebanon did you have in which had a Shiite husband, Sunni uh, wife, Sunni husband, Shiite wife, are also in, in, in Pakistan and India. I list another 500 of them myself. It was a very common thing. So this we should not uh, project that back into history. Anyway, the first four, few centuries are very malleable. Each school trying to establish itself, its method of tafsir, interpretation of the Quran, of hadith, and so on and so on. And the great classical books of Sufism come out. Now, most of the classical books of Sufism are written by Persians, some by Arabs, but there are there are Sunnis. Mansur al-Hallaj, the greatest perhaps early Arab Sufi, uh, Arabic writing Sufi poet, was from Persia. He was from Fars, from the southern province of Persia. But he lived in Baghdad, was a student of Junaid, and it was there that he, he was killed ultimately. 
And a lot of his early writers, some were Arabs, the Rabbi al Adawiya, Hassan al Basri, the patriarch of early Sufism, they were Arab. But many of the others, the school of Baghdad and later on, the school of Khorasan, they were Persians and they were Sunnis, but they wrote about Sufism. Uh, nevertheless, a great deal, but they're Persians, not Arabs writing about Sufi. It's not a question of Arab Persian, it's a question of Sunni Shah. The great center of Sunnism in the 10th, 11th century the Islamic world was Khorasan. It's Khorasan that kept Sunni orthodoxy, while Syria was Shiite, uh, Iraq was, uh, Iran was ruled by the Buyids, who were Shiites, and all the Caliph was in Baghdad, they ruled over the Caliph himself uh, politically but Khorasan was a great center. So I want to set this straight. The first few centuries are a very malleable uh, uh, period. You must have a regime of Sunni Mishism. And then you have the fourth to the seventh Islamic centuries or eighth Islamic century and the Mongol invasion. That's up to the 13th century, from the 10th to the 13th century. In which you begin to get more interactions of a positive kind intellectually between uh, the Shiites and the Sufis of uh, Sunni uh, background or uh, following the Sunni Sharia. And this leads to the Mongol invasion. The Mongol invasion decimates the Eastern lands of Islam. But paradoxically, the Mongols were not against Sufism. They did not on purpose destroy Sufi centers. Of course, the place like Neishabur was raised to the ground and it was killed, including the cats and dogs, uh, Sufi or non-Sufi, that's, uh, that's an exception. But most of other places, they left Sufism alone and so Sufism began to play a very important role in reviving, in reviving Islamic culture and civilization, the madrasas, the school system, but so many things, Islamic art. And it's at that time, it's at that time that the grandson of Holoku, himself the grandson of Chinggis Khan, Holoku, the conqueror of Persia, the Mongol conqueror of Persia, his grandson decided to embrace Islam. And he, in, or, uh, or other religions of the Middle East, he invited a Zoroastrian, a Jew, a Christian, a Sunni, and a Shiite before him to debate about religion, and he said he would decide. And the result of that was that he chose to become not only a Muslim, but to become a Shiite called Sultan Muhammad Khudabandi. That was came as um, Persian name, that was Muhammad, who was Arabic, Khudabandi means Abdullah, servant of God. Khuda means God, of course, uh, and Bandi means Abd, uh, servant or slave of God. It came to Muhammad Khudabandi, and Shizm began to spread at that time in uh, Persia before the coming of, of the Safavids and became very closely associated with Sufi orders to the extent that I shall mention just a second before my time runs out, that uh, the founder of the Sufi order, which made Persia Shiite, that is Safiuddin Ardabili, the great saint of Ardabil. Ardabil is a city in Northwestern Persia, Iran, uh, near the Caspian Sea, going north from uh, of Tehran, going west and north. Was, mausoleum is there, the great, very beautiful mausoleum, much of which was stolen by the Russians, the objects, but the building remains. Uh, the rest of it is in the Hermitage Museum in, in uh, St. Petersburg. They, uh, in the 19th century, they just carried everything they could away, but the building, the remarkable building, marks the beginning of the Safavid uh, dynasty that actually as a Sufi order, Safavids were a Shiite order, but at the same time, they were Sufis. I mean, they were, they were Shiite and they were Sufi order. Yeah, Safavid Ardabili created a Sufi order, which still exists in Iraq, but of course had a lot of problems, I'll mention for you in a moment. So we come to post-Mongol period, it was a very, very favorable time for Sufism, but coincides with the spread of Shiism in what is today Persia. That is the western part of old Persia. The eastern part, which constitutes presently Afghanistan, and northern part of Khorasan, Turkmenistan, and so forth, remain for the Baluchistan and Pakistan today, remain Sunni. And they still to this day, 
But the Western part, including most of present-day Persia, going into Iraq, became Shiite at the same time under the influence of Sufism. And you enter a new phase, which leads us to the last few centuries. Now, in the last few centuries, uh, we could spend, of course, a year talking about it. But very briefly, I want to mention the three worlds, the Ottoman, the Muslim Indian, and the Persian Iranian world. Uh, briefly as uh, concerning the relationship between Sufism and Shiism. In the Ottoman world, Sufism was very prevalent, as was the Persian language. Before the Safavids came, once the Safavids came and they declared Shiism as the official religion of this big empire, the created on the back of the Ottomans, the Ottomans were facing Europe at that time mostly, and they saw some of the great power rising in their back. Uh, the attitude in the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman, the Ottomans were Sunni, they were Hanafis, that was the official school of law, and they're full of Sufi orders, but to Shiism changed. A lot of the Shiites in Ottoman world went underground, and they became Alawis and other people like that, which survived to this very day in Eastern Anatolia. And also, yeah, there were some Sufi orders in the Ottoman world, which were, although in the Sunni world, were really Shiite Sufi orders. Perhaps of all the Sufi orders, the one who uh, centralizes Ali most is the Bektashi order. The Bektashi order did not, although its founder was Persian, did not spread in Iran. There are no Bektashi in Iran, but spread by wildfire in the Ottoman world and went all the way to Albania. Uh, even now that Anwar Khoja has gone, thank God, and the uh, Sufi centers have been rebuilt in Albania and, and other places, Bosnia and places like that, you have all the Bektashi centers, beautiful gardens in, Ma in Macedonia, northern Macedonia, where now the, which the Bektashi have taken over again after Tito and the communists left. Uh, so you had an order which, in a sense, is a Sufi. Shiite order within the Ottoman world. And then you have, of course, this great uh, Molevi order founded by Jalaluddin Rumi, who was a Persian. Some Persian tried to claim that he was a Shiite. I believe he was not a Shiite. Of course, he spoke on the point that we have Islamic esotericism, which unifies Sunnism and Shiism. But he wrote some of the most beautiful poems about Ali. Every Persian knows that Ali Amuz, Akhlas Amal, that is learned from Ali the purity of intention in action. It's a beautiful poem. Uh, and many other references, many other references, and also to the Mahdi. And some people think even Shamsuddin Tabrizi, a friend of, of uh, Rumi, was not in fact a human being. It was that 12th Imam. There was some people in Iran who write about this. So you have this complicated situation in the Ottoman world in which the uh, official religion is Sunni, because of opposition to the Safavids, Shiism is opposed, but it manifests itself in other ways. The other great Islamic empire east of, of Persia was very different. There you have India. You had, first of all, a, again, a very strong presence of the Persian language. It was through Persian Sufi literature that essentially Islam was spread east of Sindh and, and from Gujarat on all the way to Bengal, all of the, the vast land of India. The vehicle for spread was the Persian Sufi tradition. At the same time, you had a lot of Shiites who lived in, uh, in that area or migrated to that area. And some of these had very close relation with the Mughals, the Mughal Empire of India, and also the Bahmanis in the south of the Shiite dynasty. Muslim Shiite dynasty ruling in the southern Hyderabad. So with a lot of contact uh, going on. And so you had uh, in India, a uh, very close rapport between uh, Shiism and Sufism. It's a, a world half unknown still. There's no so many texts concerning the subject, figures who appear and the vision of 
uh, the Shia imams or Shia writers or philosophers or Sufi writers and so forth from the, from the Shia world in India is very different from the Arab world or uh, even the Ottoman world. You, know, sh you should know. Now we come to Persia itself. My time is coming to an end, and I have to give a chance to ask me some questions. In Persia itself, uh, you, of course, uh, as I said, had the Safavi Sufi order. Safavi, S A V A F I. It should be W A technically, but it's an English word, not Safa, S A F A V I, excuse me. S A F A Safa V. The Safavid dynasty was established 1499, 1500, very easy date to remember. And very rapidly, most of Persia became shut, as I said, but not all the eastern provinces, which later on, because of British influence, uh, partly taken over by the uh, by British Crown uh, colony in India, uh, by the British, and then Afghanistan, but created by, with their help to create a buffer zone between the Persian Empire and the Indian Empire, in a sense. Anyway, uh, in this rather large, vast world, at the beginning, uh, Sufism was very prevalent. It's one of two times in Islamic history in which Sufi, a Sufi order had directly taken over political rule of a major country. The other being the Idrisids of, of Libya, of course, and the, when, before Gaddafi destroyed the monarchy in Libya, King Idris, uh, Sanusi, there were Sanusis, San, uh, was the head of the Sanusi order, was the head of the Sufi order, and was the Sandan king of Libya, a Sunni phenomenon. In Iran, it is a Shiite phenomenon, as the biggest case in Islamic history, in which the Sufi dynasty actually become the rulers. Shah Ismail, the founder of the Soviet dynasty, although the teenager, was considered the head of the Safavid Sufi order. So the first half of uh, the history of the Safavids, that is in the 16th and early 17th century, you had the domination of a Sufi order, opposed to other Sufi orders, especially the Nematullahi, who then migrated from Iran, their sheikhs, and went to southern India, and then, then come back to the Qajar period. But you had uh, this contention with the other Sufi orders, but the Safavid Sufi order was very central. The ulama like Sheikh Bahadin Amali, with the Sheikh Al-Islam of Isfahan, was also a famous Sufi. They had a lot of combination of uh, Shiite, even religious uh, authority, and Sufism going together. Uh, until, because of its uh, advantages, you might say, from worldly advantages, many people tried to jump on the bandwagon of uh, Shiism, who, uh, who were not really of Sufism, were not really Sufis, and Sufism began to decay. The ulama began to speak against it. And uh, the second half of the, of the Shia, of Soviet rule was marked by the opposition of Shiite ulama to, to Sufism. And this is a long story again I will not go into. And the situation lasts like this until the Qajars come to power in 1795, they established the last major dynasty before the Pahlavis were the last dynasty in Iran before the Iranian Revolution. And during the Qajar period, a number of prime ministers of the early Qajar kings, especially Mirza Aghasi, they were very much attracted to Sufism. They re-invited, they re-invited the sheikhs for, uh, of the Nematollah order from India, who came back to Persia. It was a major revival of Sufism in Qajar period of the Nematollah order of the Zahabi order, which is a specifically Shiite uh, Sufi order with the center in Shiraz, and uh, the Khaksar, which was a more popular order, and so forth. Uh, while the Sunni orders in uh, Kurdistan, which remained Sunni, the Qadariya and the Naqshbandiya survived on their own. So, you uh, but they're in good terms, the, the Shiite authorities treated them that well. And this situation lasted right into our own times. And so I want to conclude, my time is almost up, with three figures uh, as well as uh, who typify the relationship between Sunni uh, Sufism and Shiism in Iran, but with a little prelude before that. 
Sufism survives very much among some of the ulama of the Sunni world, especially in Egypt and Al-Assad University. The secret Sufi order there, the son mentioned publicly. And these people also are very close, a very positive view of Shaitan. That's all I want to say, because they're living, they're living in present day dictatorial Egypt. I don't want to mention their names, but just pass that by. But I want to turn to three figures in uh, Persia itself, uh, all of whom, with all of whom have been personally associated, who marked the synthesis between Shiism and Sufism in their own lives. First is Allama Taba Tabai, my teacher of 20 years, one of the greatest philosophers of Persia, and it was through Hekma philosophy that essentially uh, Sufi ideas became more accepted in the class of ulama, you might say. That's also another story about which I've written a great deal, but it's not for today's lecture. Alam uh, Tawatawai was my teacher on every level, practically, from spiritual to the external, and I studied many years of philosophy and Sufism with him. Uh, and uh, he practiced Sufism in a very, very esoteric and hidden manner. He was one of the great ulama of Qom. And uh, his countenance, his words, what he said, what he wrote, represents a deep wedding between what he called Afran, because in Persian, because of the attack in the late Safavid period against Sufism, Sufism of the number called Afran, which means gnosis in the real sense, and that is sapiental illuminative knowledge. Anyway, uh, he practiced Afran. At the same time, was a great teacher and synthesized a Shiite Erfan, a Shiite Gnosis, with uh, Sufism as we know it. You know, Ghazali, people like that extremely well. Ibn Arabi, I, I studied Ibn Arabi's text with him, master of the teacher of Ibn Arabi. Then you have Ayatollah Khomeini, so famous, the founder of, of the Islamic Republic of Iran, but not everybody knows that Ayatollah Khomeini from his youth in Rome was a quest of Sufism. He finally founded a master who initiated him into Sufism. And for all those decades, until he went into exile and entered into politics during the late period of the Shah and then came back and became leader of Iran, that's only the last part of his life. But decades and decades, he spent his life both studying and teaching Sufism and Hikmat, that is, traditional philosophy, theosophy, which goes back to Mullah Sadra and people like that. And he was really a master of the explanation of Sufi doctrine. He knew Ibn Arabi inside out. People don't associate that with him. He also composed Sufi poems. He was a very good poet. And some of the poetry is remarkable. Uh, uh, one of them was translated by William Chittick in the New York Times because he didn't allow his divan to come out while he was alive. After he died, his, his descendants brought it out and it's not available. The third figure is still alive. I want to mention his name, called Hassan Zadeh Amuli. And he's in his late eighties, he's very sick. And one of the greatest students of Allama Tawadawai in the field of Sufism. He's a commentator upon Ibn Arabi's Fuzuz al-Hakam the author of several works on Sufism at the highest level, at the highest level and belong to the very top of the metaphysical, Gnostic philosophical explanation of Sufism. At the same time, of course, is Shia Alam, one of the famous ulama in Rome. So you see right before your eye, you see the survival of this relationship between Sufism and Shiism, but at the same time, Although the founder of the Islamic Republic of Iran was in himself a great defendant of Sufism, he prevented some of his uh, radical followers from tearing down the tomb of Hafez and Shiraz. And he said, I would hang them if they do that. He was very strict about that, protected the, the Sufi orders. Now in Iran, you have a lot of uh, young Shiites, some of whom are secretly, without them knowing it, financially supported by Saudi money that comes into Iran from different sources. Anyway, to oppose Sufism, and even to oppose Atollah Khomeini, 
I myself, my writers are well known in Iran. I, I, I face this problem. I always publish, so I'm in exile. I can't go back, but my writings are always there. And they always come up with any problem. Now there's some people who are attacking from a Sufi point of view, not because I was associated with the ancien regime or something like that. So you have a very paradoxical situation now. But nevertheless, the wedding in a deeper sense between the origins of Sufism and Shiism, that is not a temporary marriage, it's a permanent marriage. And although there may be periods of separation, it's always coming back together. And one cannot really understand fully the phenomena of both Sufism and Shiism without also relating one to the other. I think I shall stop here. My time is up exactly. Uh, in fact, five minutes over time. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Thank you, Dr. Nasser. That was that was wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So we have we have 43 questions so far in the Q&A. <laughs> I can't uh, possibly read them all, but I, I can summarize a number of them for you. And I'll, I'll sort of act as the, the translator here. There were, I might divide these questions into two parts. There, there were a number of questions that are internal to Islam. And then there were some questions that were more comparative, wanted to know something about Sufism in relationship to Advaita Vedanta or to Christian Gnosticism or to medieval Kabbalah or something. So maybe let's start, let's start with the more internal ones. There were a lot of questions around two words, Irfan and Tasawuf, and wanted you to sort of describe what the similarities or differences were and how those play into this conversation. Very good question. Fine. The word uh, tasawwuf, of course, has been debated whether it comes from wool suf or it comes from the first dawn of prayer saf and so forth. I will not get into that. The word irfan, although it's of Arabic origin, has different meaning in Persian and Turkish as a result of Persian, Ottoman Turkish, than it does in Arabic. In Arabic, it means any form of knowledge. There's even a journal like Reader's Digest in Arabic published the Persian call, called Al Arfan. Has nothing to do with mysticism or uh, gnosis or anything like that in it. But in Persian, it means a form of knowledge which is illuminative, transformative, which has to do with the divine principle and would uh, cl most closely be translated into English as gnosis or theosophy in its original sense, not as modern theosophy, of course. The, you know what uh, what what that is. I, I don't mean that. I mean like Jakob Böhme, like uh, people like that. So uh, that uh, difference between the two really uh, is in their historical use. Uh, before the 16th century or so, the word Erfan was always used within a sentence referring to uh, Gnostic matters. Even even Abyssina uh, uses it, but. Uh, after that, because of this problem that came up in the Safavid period, a lot of the people who were dealing with Sufism, not wanting to use the word Tasavov, they used the word Erfan. And so the word Erfan became prevalent and it became a very favored word. I will give you an example who asked this question. We have a lot of uh, music, classical music in Persia which is inspired, most of it, in fact, by Sufism. Going back to the Qajar period uh, and uh, uh, when there were great Sufi pe people in the late Qajar period, Pahlavi period, like Darvish Khan, Abdullah Khan, people like that, who belong to Sufi families. And uh, a, lot, a lot of per Persian classical music is sung with Sufi poetry of Rumi, of Hafez, of Attar, of even the greatest Persian Sufi poets. <coughs> but in Persian, it's called Musiri Erfani, Erfani music. Because of the cultural climate and the opposition to the word Sufi that uh, was created because of the historical processes, some of which I mentioned in my lecture to you. So uh, in principle, Erfan is uh, the aspect of knowledge of Sufism. 
but in practice it has come to replace Sufism in the Persian language just uh, two centuries ago. Thank you. Um, let's maybe summarize all of these comparative questions. A number of people asked about the relationship between Sufism or Shi'i esotericism vis-a-vis -vis Advaita Vedanta, medieval Kabbalah, and Christian Gnosticism. So can you speak to this kind of big comparative question about how to relate these different traditions that are initiatic in some sense? Yes, I'll do all three. Let me start with the end. I don't like the term Christian Gnosticism. Okay. But that makes it peripheral. It should be Christian mysticism. Okay. <laughs> That's just the but, question. Because, you know, you're a professor of religion, you know, that uh, anathema, which uh, in a sense hovered over the term Gnosticism in, in, in Catholic theology in the early Middle Ages and later on even today. The Catholic Church and the Catholic writer tried to avoid this term because associated with a particular school uh, which arose in the early centuries of Christianity and is not in the mainstream of Christianity. I would prefer to use Christian mysticism. Uh, now, uh, Christian mysticism is essentially a path of love. Christianity emphasizes love above everything else. And uh, most of the Christian mystics followed the path of love. But there were Christian mystics who followed the path of Gnosis, not Gnosticism, but of, of divine knowledge. Origin among the early writers was perhaps uh, Clement of Alexander. These two are the most notable. But you have elements of his son Augustine. You certainly have it in Don Scotus Origina. You have it in Nicholas of Cusa. These people are writing about God, not only from the point of love of God, but also knowledge of God. And then it gets into the German mystical, Rhenish mystical uh, movement, which in a sense is crowned by uh, Jakob Böhmen. Uh, in uh, the Kabbalah, there the uh, Kabbalistic doctrines are very similar to Sufism. First of all, Kabbalah, of course, is not only Abrahamic religion, but one that, like Islam, kept within the Semitic world more than Christianity, became Europeanized and the Greek and Latin became its main languages. The Kabbalah preserved Hebrew as a Semitic language, as Islam has preserved Arabic as a Semitic language. And a lot of mystical ideas associated with the Hebrew language and letters and numerology and so forth are very similar to what we have in Islam. So in a sense, although the Kabbalah uh, starts with the mystical aspect of, of a particular religion, Judaism, which was not very numerous, they were, but they were spread all over Europe and so became known in the also later on Christian Kabbalah. Both of these, uh, uh, not only the, the original Kabbalah, Jewish Kabbalah, but also spread into the Christian world and the results have many elements which are similar to Islamic metaphysics as we find actually in Sufism. Uh, as for the uh, east of Islam, the Hindu world, uh, Hinduism is really like a museum in which all kinds of things are displayed, all kinds of different schools of thought are present. But I'm glad the person who asked that question brought up the question of the Advaita Vedanta. Uh, Advaita Vedanta is based on the idea of non-duality. And Islamic metaphysics on the highest level also is based on the idea of non-duality. Even beyond uh, describing God as one, there's a beautiful Sufi text that says, O oh one, that is God, one God, who cannot even be limited by the concept of oneness. Even that is a kind of limitation. Going to Advaita, that's Advaita, non-dualism. They don't use... Uh, Oneness, but there's non-dualism starting with a negative, a kind of via negativa, like Christian theology, that you have in the Upanishad, neti neti, when uh, Yazdavalka asks about the nation of Brahman. And he says, not this, not that, not this, not that, negates. And so it's really very like, much like the via negativa of some of the Christian mystics. And we have a lot of development in the Islamic world, especially in the Eastern of Islam in Persia, 
which was a neighbor of India, in which there are uh, ideas very similar, very, very similar to what you find in the Advaita Vedanta. I, don't, I hate to give reference to my own works, but I just received last month an article from India written by a famous Hindu scholar who I do not know about my understanding of the Advaita Vedanta. That is a very complicated matter. Uh, I refer that gentleman or lady who asked that question, perhaps they can read that essay. Thank you. So we have another question, this time actually from one of our own graduate students, essentially asking what you consider the, the areas in most need of research um, among um, these mystical and Sufi groups, particularly as it might pertain to cosmology. Uh, she's a big fan of your, your work on, on Shia cosmology. So is there, where would you like um, a young graduate student to go? these days in terms of an intellectual project? Uh, of Islamic cosmology or? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, sadly, ever since uh, my book, Islamic Cosmology came out at Harvard in 1964, there has not been another book on cosmology uh, uh, like that written. But there are essays and articles. William Chittick's book, The Self-Disclosure of God, has is a very good book on Sufi cosmology, going back to the school of the Arabi, which influenced many of the later schools of cosmology. I suggest that uh, this gentleman, lady, whoever it is, is graduate student, uh, consult that book. Also, it has an extensive bibliography. And my own book on cosmology was republished several times, the latest edition, published by the State University of New York Press, has an augmented added uh, bibliography which is almost all the more recent works on cosmology, where some of them are in French or German, so we can't read the script those, but all the ones in English. Okay. We have another question here to kind of take it in another direction, asking you to sort of reflect on these ideas you've articulated, how they play out in a, in a US context with, with uh, American Muslim communities in particular. Uh, those are really two questions. U.S. context could be the policy of the State Department of the Middle East, but it could be also the Muslims in America. They're two very different things. I think I think they mean Muslims in America. I see. I see. All right. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, I do not believe there are three billion Muslims uh, that some people write about. I think there are about seven billion Muslims in America today. The majority of them are Sunnis, but they have a very large Shiite minority, not only in the Los Angeles area, where I have a million Iranians living. Some of them don't follow Islam seriously, but many of them do. And there are many Shiite mosques built, also in other areas of the United States. Uh, there are, there's a lot of Shiite presence, but the majority is uh, Sunni. And uh, the relation between them is usually very good. Uh, I'm sorry to say that this, those mosques supported by the Saudis uh, uh, support on the condition that uh, you know they keep away from Sufism and Shiism and so forth, and they were anti. Uh, but uh, for example, the center near Washington, which was built by the Turks, uh, uh, is very very open. Uh, and uh, before these recent events in the old days, I'd given hundreds of lectures in the United States to Muslim groups. Nobody asked whether I was a Sunni or a Shiite, and this uh, issue was not present. But now it has become present. And uh, there are also a number of Sufi uh, orders in the United States now. Uh, some of them, most of them are uh, Sunni oriented, but some are Shiite oriented. But many young Muslims in America, uh, I have a lot of contact with many of them. They call me, they send me emails, send me letters, and so on and so on. I have a lot of contact with them. Most of them, in fact, say, oh, we're not Sunni, we're not Shia, we're Muslim. They even want not to identify themselves with one group. I tell them, look, you have to transcend the dichotomy. The dichotomy created by God. You cannot say neither Sunni nor Shia. What are you inventing, your own school of law? So I decided to dissuade them from doing that, but the idea is quite important. 
and they want to emphasize the unity actually of Islam is very, very strong. I founded the very first uh, Muslim student association in American University, at Harvard University in 1954 when I went to Harvard from the MIT. I was president for four years until I went to Iran. And I was a Shiite, the vice president was a Sunni, the treasurer was also a Sunni. We never even spoke about these terms. We celebrated uh, special Sunni holidays, special Shiite holidays, and that which is common to both. And I think that spirit is still very much prevalent. And in fact, with all the money, effort that is being spent by different forces that be, to augment differences between Sunnis and Shias in the Middle East, and to throw kerosene upon the fire. Despite all of that, the vast majority of people in the Islamic world, including most of the ulama, are in favor of some kind of accord between the two. Mm -hmm. And the Muslims of America, in America can play a very important role in that process. Because they're independent of local political pressure, the government has said, why did you write this against Shiism or for Shiism or against Sunnism or for Sunnism? There's much more freedom in this field. And so I think the play will play a very important role. That, I think that leads really well into a question that was just actually asked. We're up to 62 now. And I think you may have already answered this. And perhaps we can make this one of our last questions. Do you have any advice for encouraging unity between the different branches of Islam? Yes, yes, definitely. First of all, let's turn to the question, who is a Muslim? The question is answered different different religions. For example, in Christianity, you have to receive the right of baptism. In Islam, whoever says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah is a Muslim. That is, there is no divinity about God and the Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. Now, what you say after that, Ali and Waliullah, whatever you say, does not change that. So we have to go back to the question of the unity of Islam. First of all, we have one single book, one single book, the Quran, the Quran and the Sunni and Shiite versus the same. Not, there's no difference. It's, some of the punctuations differ, but also differ within the Sunni world. But it's no more than punctuation. That's it. And then we have the main doctrines of Islam, the doctrine of divine unity, of prophecy, of eschatology, that it both Mabda and Ma'ad, where we come from and where we are going. This is common between uh, Sunnis and Shiites. And the fact that we've had different histories is because of God's mercy. When this, there's only one sun, but when it shines upon a town, sometimes it shines upon a roof that is metallic, sometimes upon a roof that is stone. And the reflection might not be identical, but it's the same sun, the same ray. And there's no religion without multiplicity. Even Judaism, which is a small number of followers, there are Sephardi Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, uh, Orthodox Jews, Reformed Jews, and so forth and so forth. Christianity has had not only a later separation of Protestantism from Catholicism, but in the early days, the Orthodox and, and Catholic churches developed differently, and the Church of Ethiopia and the Coptic Church and so forth, Oriental churches, their own way. This is, this is natural. That is, uh, from a metaphysical, religious point of view, is part of God's bounty and God's mercy. Because God has created us differently. They're not all the same. But the great religions of the world have to have the needs of satisfying the spiritual needs of their followers. And they're not identical. We're not like bottles that comes out of a factory, all the Pepsi-Cola bottles looking alike. Yes, there are certain common elements between us, and that's why there's certain common elements in every religion for all its followers. But there are also these particularities, emphases of this and that, which cater to the psychological, cultural needs of different people. And Islam is no different that, in that sense than any other religion. And that I do not believe is a negative thing at all, as long as one clings to the unity that binds not only 
various schools of Islam together, but ultimately all religions are come from heaven. I believe in the unity of religion and the oneness of religions on the highest level. We all come from God and to him is our return. And I will show this end of this verse with the Quran says, Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi ilayhi raja'un. Verily we come from God and to God is our return. Let's say Muslim, Inna, anybody who can say we, Inna in Arabic here means we, includes both you and I. So the starting point of it's not I who come from God, it is God, but also you, your son. My son, our neighbor, somebody living in India, where, where they happen to be. But I think uh, my advice to uh, the person who asked that question, where must, must have been a Muslim student, is that uh, you should not forego the universality of Islam for the sake of expediency. You should be strong enough and brave enough to do that. I think I will stop here and yeah, that's actually a really good, that's a good theological place to stop, I think. I think that's, <laughs> that's, I think that's, that's a wrap, as we say. Um, let me just act as moderator, Dr. Nasser, and thank you one more time. Uh, and thank the Kazemi family one more time for this lecture series. A number of you have asked about a recording of this lecture. There is a recording, and it will be posted on the School of Humanities website when it's properly edited and polished and ready. But yes, it, it was recorded and yes, we will make it available. So I also just want to give my greetings to the Cosme family. I, I, I encourage will. them for having created this possibility. Okay, the last thing I will say, there will be a very sudden stop to this. When we, when we shut the computer off, it'll just disappear. We don't, we don't mean to be sudden, but it's just a function of the software that when this ends, this really ends. So thank you again, Dr. Nasser. Thank you, thank you Kazumi family. It's, it's been a pleasure and, uh, and an honor.